part of the Press Play Podcast Network. Hey, this is Chase Smith, founder and CEO of Press Play Podcast. You may have heard me on the Oranges, Oranger, Cleveland Browns podcast with Jeremy Powell, now wonderfully hosted by Holly Wetzel, Cavs on the Break NBA podcast with Sam Amico, or my own podcast, the Chase Smith Podcast. I wanted to take a few moments to talk to you about a brand new subscription-based podcast we're offering this football season, the Press Play Sports Podcast. This premium podcast feed will send all of the sports podcasts offered on the Press Play Podcast Network to one central feed. Yes, you can still follow and subscribe to all of our individual shows for free on every podcast platform, but if you wanted to consolidate your podcast feed and listen to them all in one location, the Press Play Sports Podcast is for you. I'm talking the Oranges and Orange Browns podcast with Holly Wetzel and Jeremy Powell, Red Guy and Rhoda, Sable Brothers on the Baseline, Cavs on the Break, the Dennis Maniloff Show, the Ball Card Show, the Premium Fantasy Podcast, a Swing and a Tribe MLB Podcast, and the Tim and Shipe Show, a college football podcast, all in one feed. All nine of our sports shows curated into one single podcast feed. Out the door, you're looking at five thirty six a month after tax. That's five dollars and thirty six cents, just about the cost of a drink at Starbucks. And this is only offered on Apple Podcasts. You can't get this anywhere else. It's an Apple Podcast exclusive. Just go to the search bar and search "Press Play Sports." It'll come up, and you and you can subscribe from there. We're excited to offer this consolidated, curated sports feed for you to enjoy. And as always, thank you so much for listening and your support. Welcome to the latest edition of the Dennis Maniloff Show, part of the Press Play Podcast Network. Shea Smith and I come to you several hours after the Cleveland Browns completed a 31-21 victory over the Houston Texans. It was a Sunday afternoon game at First Energy Stadium in Cleveland. And you know what? Right off the rip, a win is a win. I mean, you hear that over and over when when you talk about the NFL because there aren't that many games available because of the regular season only has so many. You typically was 16, now it's 17 this year. But you only get so many of these chances and – Winning, we are told, those of us who've never played, never approached NFL caliber, uh, is very, very hard to do on a week-to-week basis. So, first and foremost, you give credit to the Cleveland Browns for winning the game. They beat the team that was on the schedule. They beat that team by double digits. They rebounded enough from the – Disappointing loss the previous week, week one at Kansas City. So props to the Browns. And they won the home opener. You know, raucous crowd we could see on TV. Those of us watching on TV or listening on radio could see it, hear it. Great job by the fans who who packed First Energy Stadium. Looked great on TV. The, the You know, the sights and sounds, everything was fine. So that's good. However, it was not that great of a performance by the Cleveland Browns. I think Chase Smith would agree with me. I think Jeremy Powell would agree with me. Most people who watched this game today and had a rooting interest in the Browns would probably agree with me that this was not the best effort by the home team. And yeah, they won by double digits, but they beat a bad Texans team They beat a bad Texans team that was on essentially its third quarterback. If you want to count Deshaun Watson as their number one quarterback, he's no longer their number one quarterback. They're bending over backwards to make sure he doesn't play a snap, and yet he's active, and the NFL hasn't come down from on high and done anything about Deshaun Watson, so that's a bizarre world. But Bottom line is, if if Watson did not have all the allegations against him, he would be playing for the Texans, and Tyrod Taylor would be the backup, and and Davis uh, Mills would be the number three quarterback. Well, today the Browns got Tyrod Taylor, the starter, and Davis Mills had to come in for Taylor after halftime because Taylor exited because of an injury, because of a hamstring. While Tyrod Taylor, the former Brown and mentor to Baker Mayfield, was in the game – Tyrod Taylor did an excellent job. He really did. 10 of 11 for a buck 25 and a touchdown. No picks, no sacks. And he rushed once for 15 yards in a TD. 
So Tyrod Taylor was on his way to an outstanding game. Would he have carried the Texans to victory over the Browns? I doubt it. But the bottom line is he was doing well. And the Browns got a break when his hamstring uh, went south on him and he was replaced by Davis Mills. Mills wasn't atrocious, but he wasn't good. Eight of 18 for 102 yards, one TD, one pick, one sack. The Browns only beat the Houston Texans by 10 is really how it should be viewed. That's the uh, that's the nut graph here is they needed to be better. They will be better. They were better last week against the Kansas City Chiefs, much better. Last week, they would have beaten a ton of teams in the NFL. This week, they probably would have lost to most of the good teams in the NFL with this kind of performance, specifically the defensive performance. The offense, once again, answered the bell by and large, scored enough points, 31, and you know, was getting the ball in the end zone as opposed to settling for field goals. The offense was doing its job, but the defense struggled today. And one of the numbers that stood out to me, I would say the most glaring number when I, when I talk about the defense struggling, relatively speaking, relative to the opponent, is the fact that the Houston Texans were 8 of 14 on third down. You can't allow the Houston Texans to come into your building with Tyrod Taylor and Davis Mills and go 8 of 14 on third down. Another number that jumped out, one. That's the number of sacks the Browns had on Taylor and Mills. One sack. And that sack did not come from the D-line or even the linebackers. It came from Grant Delpit, the safety. You cannot have Miles Garrett on your team, Jadavion Clowney on your team, various other uh, you know rushers on your team or, or members of that D line, and only manage one sack, and the sack comes from the third level, if you will, the safety Grant Delpit. So disappointing overall from the Browns, even though the opponent didn't amass all that many total yards. In fact, as I look at the final uh, stats here, the Texans, I want to say they were a little over 300 in total yards. So they really didn't, uh, you know, dominate on that front. But you can't have this defense. If this team, the Browns, wants to go places, you cannot have – the defense only sacked the quarterback one time and give up eight third down conversions. The offense we mentioned was good, good enough certainly to beat the bad Texans. Baker Mayfield, 19 to 21 for 213, a touchdown, a pick, two sacks, 14 for 14 yards lost. Nick Chubb led the uh, the rushers, 11 carries for 95 yards. Demetric Felton, two catches for 51 yards. A a teaser, those three guys will be featured in the uh, game balls that I'm going to hand out in the next segment. So the offense balanced and ran the ball when it needed to. I think back to the fourth quarter, my favorite possession of the game, and it's fairly obvious that it it, it should be most people's favorites, uh, favorite when it comes to the Browns, after the Texans had their ginormous possession, it took forever, like eight minutes and eight seconds. It was 15 or 16 plays, 70-some yards. The Texans had pulled within three, 24-21. The Browns got the ball and went 82 yards, and I think it was nine plays. It was Chubb. It was Hunt. It was a little bit of Felton. It was Baker on a scramble. And they went right down the field, answered that touchdown with a touchdown of their own. It was the Nick Chubb TD to get back to a 10-point lead, 31-21. Incredibly good job by the Browns there. And 
I really like the fact that Kevin Stefanski didn't panic. You know, once he had seen the Texans get within three, it was not like, okay, I got to sling the ball all over the yard. He stayed patient. He went to his, his, his big guys in the back uh, field, Chubb and Hunt, and it paid off. And yes, you could say, well, part of that, part of what dictated that strategy was the fact that Stefanski knew that he didn't have OBJ. OBJ didn't play today and he didn't have Jarvis Landry. Landry was out early. He was out in the first series uh, because of a knee injury. We hope the best for Jarvis, the ultimate gamer. So you could say that Stefanski was limited in what he could do through the air, but I still think he showed a lot of patience there in the fourth quarter when he know when he knew he needed a scoring possession. He'd preferably have it be a touchdown, and he was willing to run the ball and and didn't just say, "Okay, we're going to sling it." And, and try to go down the field with bombs or anything like that. So as I sum up the first segment of the podcast, I'm happy the Browns won. They deserve to be uh, happy with themselves to a to an extent. They treated the home fans to a, a victory. Victories are hard to come by in the NFL. The NFL stands for not for long for plenty of reasons. One of them is, you know, it's difficult for coaches and teams and players to win a lot of games and they can be gone quickly if they don't. So all of that said, the Browns have plenty of work to do, plenty of improving to do that. They know it. And I fully expect them to be better in game three against the Chicago bears. When we return for the next segment of the Dennis Maniloff show, part of the press play podcast network, I'll give out my Browns game balls from week two. Hi, this is Maria Ginkola with Mindful MMJ Ohio. Did you know that medical marijuana has been legal in Ohio since 2016? If you have one of 25 qualifying medical conditions, you can obtain your medical marijuana card today. The most common conditions are chronic pain, including migraines and back or joint pain, PTSD, fibromyalgia, spinal cord disease or injury, and cancer. If you or someone you know is interested in learning more or to find out if you qualify, visit mindfulmmjohio.com and fill out the short pre-qualification form. The process of finding a physician, filling out paperwork, obtaining medical records, and scheduling an appointment seems like it would be a daunting process for most. But lucky for you, Mindful MMJ Ohio will help you every step of the way to make the process quick and easy. In most cases, we can approve a qualified patient within 24 hours. And the visit is virtual, so you don't even have to leave home. So what are you waiting for? Visit MindfulMMJOhio.com today. That's MindfulMMJOhio.com. Let us help you be more mindful of your health and find a natural way to find relief from your symptoms. The r r Podcast is going to be rocking and rolling with you because football season is underway. College, Ohio State, the Power Fives, the Mac, the Browns. Michael Regai, are you ready to rock and roll with some football? Kenny, I've been ready. This is our time of year. This is what r r is all about. We're going to be with you every week. Kenny just said it, Browns, NFL, Ohio State-centric. So you got to stay with us all fall and winter long here on r r that's right, the Reg Eye and Rhoda podcast coming to you here on the Press Play Podcast Network. Subscribe now and don't miss a show. Hey everyone, I'm Holly Wetzel. And I'm Jeremy Powell. And we are your hosts of the Orange is Oranger, a Cleveland Browns podcast on the Press Play Podcast Network. We give you all the dog pound coverage that you'll need each week, to get you ready for kickoff and beyond. Don't miss our breakdowns of each week's matchups, game recaps, and any and all news out of Bria to feed your Browns appetite. As we all know, Holly, dogs got to eat. That's right, Jeremy. Hit that subscribe button and never miss an episode of the Orange is Orange Browns podcast on the Press Play Podcast Network. Hey, everybody. It's Sam Amico from Cavs on the Break NBA podcast. Be sure to give us a listen for all your Cleveland Cavaliers recaps, analysis, breakdowns, draft talk, free agency. The list goes on and on. Give us a listen. Cavs on the Break NBA podcast. Welcome back to the Dennis Maniloff Show, part of the Press Play Podcast Network. This episode produced by the great Chase Smith, the king of Press Play Podcast Network. Honored to be to have him producing uh, as he subs for uh, Eli. One of his, uh, you know, one of many many things that Chase does for PPP. 
game balls. Thankfully, I can give out game balls. Last week, even though the Browns played much better, played a quality opponent like the Chiefs, took them down to the wire, led for the vast majority of minutes, still lost. Um, I couldn't give out game balls. I don't give out game balls for losses. And no matter how good a player is in that game on the Browns, if they lose, I'm not giving out game balls. So today I've got seven. Number seven, the fans who attended the game. Also, tailgaters who might not have gotten into the stadium. Anybody basically who was on the grounds on the lakefront showing their support of the Browns. It was a beautiful sight on national TV, and it was, you know, you could hear it. The crowd was loud in the home opener. So I, I just the tip of the hat, tip of the helmet to Browns fans who showed out and showed up and were strong today in support of their team, and I'm sure the Browns uh, were helped by it. Number six, game ball number six, safety Grant Delpit. Welcome to the NFL, Grant Delpit, second-round pick, 44th overall in 2020, injured all of last season, inactive last week against the Chiefs. He was injured last year in camp the outset of camp and therefore was unable to play the season uh, because of the Achilles. So Delpit made his NFL debut today and he made it count. I thought he, he did a nice job overall and then had a blitz sack and forced fumble of Davis Mills in the fourth quarter. It was really good to see a Browns player blitz from, uh, you know, either the corner or safety position. I wish that Joe Woods would dial up more of those. But um, the fact is Grant Delpit came in untouched and surprised Davis Mills from the front door. He didn't even come in from the backside. He came in from the front. Mills was looking left and got smashed by Delpit. Lost the ball. The Texans picked it up and retained possession. But a huge hit for Delpit, and that's the kind of hit that you expect to see from him. Not every game, but you would hope as many games as possible. That's what you saw him do at LSU, make plays. And so Grant Delpit gets game ball number six. Game ball number five, linebacker Malcolm Smith. Eight total tackles, four solo, a tackle for loss, pass defense, a pick. He had a diving interception of Davis Mills that set up a field goal for the Browns. So a lot of credit to Malcolm Smith for a quality game. Joe Woods leaned on his linebackers more so this game than maybe he will in other games against teams that have uh, really high-flying passing attacks. The The Texans were a group that you had to defend against on the ground and you had to keep the – you know, the linebackers had to be good and Malcolm Smith was part of that group. Game ball number four, the O-line. Give it one, one game ball to all of the guys on the O-line. Whoever was in there uh, deserves it because, you know, it's hard to single out one player on the offensive line. I mean, you could say that about, you say Wyatt Teller deserves one all the time or Batonio deserves one all the time or Treader or whatnot. But this was a case where the Browns O-line did an excellent job of, of protecting Baker Mayfield, did an excellent job of setting up opportunities for, the running backs opportunities for the ground game to flourish. And you, you expect that from this group, you expect that from the Browns O line to be physical, to be good. And they were game ball. Number three, Dimitri Felton, the late round pick in 2021 out of UCLA Swiss army knife today, two catches for 51 yards, including a 33 yard touchdown on a, uh, essentially a screen pass. He was lined up in the slot on the left. He stepped back. He caught the pass, and he worked his way into the end zone with some nifty moves. So Dimitri Felton on the board as an NFL player with a touchdown. Also had two kickoff returns for 41 yards, three punt returns for 22 yards. I love watching guys who were taken late in a draft uh, excel, and that's what you're getting from Dimitri 
Felton. That's what you got from him in camp. He opened eyes. He made the team. Now he's making plays. So a great job by the Brown scouting department to grab Felton as, as late as they did in, in 2021. And he, he paid off uh, today for sure. Game ball number two, the Bake Show, Baker Mayfield. Quarterback, QB1 of the Browns, 19 to 21, one TD, one pick, 213 yards. Was sacked just twice for 14 yards. Eight carries for 10 yards, including a touchdown on the on the ground. He was intercepted once, but it's debatable about how much culpability he has for that pick. Um, after the pick that happened in the first half, he was 10 of 10 for 100 yards and a TD. Basically, Baker Mayfield did what it took to win. He was not the reason that the Browns won, but he was a reason the Browns won. And yeah, that's a familiar refrain with Mayfield because it happened a lot last year. He didn't necessarily blow you away with these eye-popping numbers, at least in terms of yardage and TD passes, but he was very efficient and he did what the game plan asked him to do to deliver a victory. He was a complimentary piece to the offense. In other words, the Browns needed him to play well. He didn't have to carry them, but they needed him to play well, and he did. That would have been fine if Baker had been healthy the entire game. He gets extra points. In fact, he almost gets a game and a half game balls, an extra half a game ball, because of the fact that he was dealing with a shoulder injury, a left shoulder injury that occurred when he was trying to make the tackle off the interception that he threw and it got bad enough that he had to leave the field went into the locker room but he came back out and he played the entire game and the Browns are glad he did no matter what anyone has said about Baker Mayfield since he came into the league number one overall 2018 out of Oklahoma you are a complete uh, fabricator if if you think this guy isn't tough as nails. He is 1,000% tough. Gritty, gutty. He, he's he been injured a lot, knocked around a lot, taken a lot of lumps early in his career, I mean, in his early career, and yet he continues to answer the bell. I would imagine certain quarterbacks wouldn't have been able to continue with that shoulder feeling the way it did and by the way we don't we're not exactly sure the extent of the injury that uh, testing remains to be done on it but Mayfield stayed in gutted it out and um he deserves props for that I know a lot of NFL players play hurt I get it I'm not trying to say that Mayfield's the only one but clearly he was injured and he was dragging that left arm and he just continued to go and and that's a, a credit to him number one game ball Nick Chubb the running back RB1 for the Browns, 11 carries for 95 yards and a touchdown. It was a 26-yarder, and it was a beauty in the fourth quarter that put the Browns up 31-21. One catch for three yards. He and Kareem Hunt combined for 24 carries on uh, for 146 yards in a TD. So Nick Chubb once again doing Nick Chubb things, bouncing off would-be tacklers, figuring out a way to gain yards when you don't think there's any way he can gain yards. Nick Chubb is, is a money, a money player and he deserves the number one game ball today. Um, he just, he was great again. And here's the thing. If the Browns had needed Chubb to rush for 150, 160 yards, he, he would have been able to do it. It's just the game plan and the way things were set up and the way Kevin Stefanski called the game. They didn't need that many carries from Nick Chubb, and they almost got 100 yards from him anyway, 11 for 95 in the touch. All right, that's the uh, the game ball wrap-up. Some people on my radio show, my end zone show on WTM 1100 and 106.9 FM here in Northeast Ohio, were saying I should have given a game ball to Sione Taki Taki, the linebacker, but okay, Taki Taki, Taki figured out a way to get on. Uh, the screen did a nice job, but I, I guess I might have shortchanged him there. But overall, seven game balls. The fans rooting for the Browns. Grant Delp at the safety. Ma- Malcolm Smith, the linebacker. The O-line, Demetric Felton, Baker Mayfield, and Nick Chubb. 
All right, when we return on the other side of the upcoming break, I will go over a couple of NFL games of note from week two other than Browns-Texans. This is Mike Voorhees, co-host of the Swing and a Tribe MLB podcast. If you love Cleveland Indians baseball, then this is the pod for you. We've got you covered each week as we talk about all the games, breaking news, trades, the roster, all things Tribe. You're going to love it. Go Tribe. Hey, I'm Jason. And I'm Gary, and we love ball cards. And if you love ball cards too, good news. You just found your new favorite podcast. From breaks to grading. And from collecting to flipping, join us on the Ball Cards Show. The sports podcast for the sports collector. Hey, it's Tito, host of the Premier Fantasy Podcast. Get all the news and analysis you need to dominate your fantasy league. I've been doing this as long as anybody in the business. I can help give you the edge in your leagues. It's the Premier Fantasy Podcast, part of the Press Play Podcast Network. Looking for new insights on the Cleveland sports scene with a unique side of Cleveland sports history? Then you found the perfect podcast. I'm John Sable. And I'm Scott Sable, and we're hosts of the Sable Brothers on the Baseline podcast, a podcast about Cleveland sports, but not your typical podcast about the land's sports teams. Join us as we embark on a journey of sharing a unique and historical side of Cleveland sports history with the help of some former Cleveland sports stars and other historical figures. All right here on the Sable Brothers on the Baseline podcast, part of the Press Play Podcast Network. Welcome back to the Dennis Maniloff Show, part of the Press Play Podcast Network. This episode produced by the great Chase Smith. I wanted to go around the NFL with some games that uh, popped off the page, popped off the screen for me. One of them, the Las Vegas Raiders. Wow. I got to say this. Plenty of critics of the paradigm of Mike Mayock, the GM, and and, uh, John Gruden, the coach. Through three years, it just hasn't been doing much. But this year, the Las Vegas Raiders, I mean, you could not have started any better. The Raiders open on Monday night at home in their palace in front of their raucous crowd, and they beat the Baltimore Ravens. And then they go on a short week, they go to Pittsburgh and beat the Steelers. Steelers were coming off a victory over the Buffalo Bills in Orchard Park, New York. So the Steelers were feeling it. They had their home opener, and the Raiders flew across country, essentially, and said, not on our watch. Uh, the Raiders are now 2-0. and Unbelievably good job by them. I don't know how many people are surprised at their 2-0 and because they have talent, but just to get to two and all the way they have with uh, victories over the Ravens and Steelers is a, a testament to that organization, to those players, coach, uh, coach John Gruden, of course, Mike Mayock in the front office, but mostly to Derek Carr quarterback, Derek Carr, one of the most underappreciated players in the NFL over the past, however many years, the guy gets nitpicked like crazy. But Derek Carr is a quality player, and his first two games have been spectacular. So it couldn't happen to a nicer guy. I love Derek Carr. I love listening to his post-game uh, interviews. He's all about the team. All he wants to do is win. He's taken a beating as the Raiders quarterback over the years on some bad teams. He deserves this kind of stuff. And, of course, he would be the first to say, hey, I'm just part of the, you know, part of the mosaic. I'm a – I'm a – cog in the wheel that's it but Derek Carr and the Raiders are 2-0 and all. props to them another result that jumped out at me just because Chase Smith told me about it Chase what in the world happened in Seattle yeah Seattle goes into halftime over the Titans it was 24 to 9 and uh, <laughs> I think it was 24 nothing at one point Chase uh I'm looking here at the kind of like the, the flow uh, the Titans had a couple field goals, uh, but it was touchdown, touchdown, touchdown. Okay. 
uh, Seahawks 24, nine going to halftime in Seattle. So you're thinking all oh, that game's over. There's no way they're going to come back. Uh, the Titans came back one and an overtime with the, with the field goal, uh, 33 to 30, 36 yarder right down the middle. The Titans go into a uh, 12th man and he got a win here game two and week two D man. Yeah. And, and chase, this is why it's crazy. The NFL is crazy every year, week to week. You never know. It, it is just bizarre world to try to get any kind of pattern out of the NFL other than maybe Tom Brady being, uh, uh, you know, great and taking his team to the playoffs all the time. Okay, that's something you can bank on. But, I mean, look at the Titans last last week. Looked awful against the Arizona Cardinals in yeah. Tennessee. They go to Seattle, and people are like, oh, they, they, this is Seahawks are going to crush them. The Seahawks were coming off a victory in Indy, in Indy so it was their home opener. Seahawks get off on them. As, as uh, Chase said, it wasn't 24 nothing, but it was big. And the Titans come all the way back when they easily could have folded and been beaten by 30. They come back to win in overtime. So uh, awesome job by Mike Vrabel's Titans. You never count out Vrabel, even when it seems like you should, you don't. Uh, another game that I saw as I was getting ready for this podcast, the Arizona Cardinals hang on to beat the Minnesota Vikings. Our old buddy Greg Joseph missed the field goal at the buzzer, if you will. I'm pretty yeah. sure it was at the horn with a chance to win it for Minnesota. And Arizona escapes in their home opener. They they improved to 2-0. and The Vikings fall to 0-2. Um, and then the other game that really caught my eye is what happened in Jacksonville. The Jacksonville Jaguars were handled by the Denver Broncos. You say, well, why are you interested in the Jacksonville Jaguars playing host to the Denver Broncos in week two? The reason is simple. Urban Meyer. Urban Meyer, one of my favorite college football coaches ever. He decided that he was finally going to scratch the NFL itch. And he was going to coach in the NFL, and it was going to be for the Jacksonville Jaguars. He had sat out last year and was doing work for uh, Fox. Or was it two years that he sat out? I think it was two. But in any event, he was out for a while. He was doing excellent job as an analyst for Fox on the college side of it and then decided, you know what, I'm going to give the NFL a try. He goes to Jacksonville. And one of the first things that he does wrong is he invites Tim Tebow or signs off on Tim Tebow coming to try out. That didn't go over well with the league. It didn't go well over well in his own locker room. All kinds of issues pertaining to Herb and how he's coaching and how he's doing things and his structure and how he's setting things up entering the season. So there was plenty of turmoil even before the season started. And then he goes to Houston with the number one overall pick in 2021 quarterback Trevor Lawrence out of Clemson. He's supposed to beat the terrible Texans, even as bad as the Jaguars were in 2020, which is say one in 15, won the first game, lost the next 15. No doubt Herb inherited a bad team, a mess, but he was supposed to go into Houston in game one and beat the bad Texans. Instead, the Texans embarrassed him. The only reason that score was moderately respectable was because the Texans uh, took the foot off the gas and Lawrence capitalized on garbage time. So after one week in the regular season, there were questions upon questions piled on to what was a lot of doubt coming out of the off season. Then Herb goes home to Jacksonville home opener and the Broncos handle them. The Broncos are decent, I guess. They're 2-0 and now, but they're not expected to be a great team. And yet they had no problem with the Jacksonville Jaguars. And Trevor Lawrence had a really bad stat line. I obviously didn't see the game, but the stat line's woeful. So you're looking at now an 0-2 Jacksonville Jaguars team under Urban Meyer. And yeah, 
Herb said last week and probably said again this week in front of the Jacksonville microphones that he's going to stick it out. You know, he wants to win badly and he's, he's down for this long haul here. Okay, fine. But even last week when the USC job popped open, Clay Helton was fired. He was asked about it. <laughs> I mean, what, just the fact that he was asked about it. What does that tell you? So Urban Meyer, I don't wish this on him at all because I like him. I know a lot of people don't like him. I do. I think he he's a tremendous college coach. But I hope for his sake he can turn this around relatively quickly and stop the the bad performances and quiet yeah. the uh, uh, you know the the murmurs and the grumblings and the mumblings within his locker room and the fan base and the media. I mean, I saw the Jaguars referred to today in a headline as woeful. Well, that, that's not good. And what's scary, too, is when Herb first got the job, I threw this number out there kind of, you know, joking, but a little bit serious. Now it's taken on a really serious vein. I said, will Urban Meyer in his NFL coaching career get to 15 victories? You say, well, 15, what are you talking about? 15, that's nothing. Why, why would you even pick out 15? 15 to me is the magic number that Herb's got to get to because Nick Saban in his one and only uh, time in the NFL as a head coach, two years with the Miami Dolphins, went 15 and 17 in the regular season before returning to college. So Nick Saban's got the number to shoot for, for Herb, and that is 15 NFL victories. It's zero so far for Herb. I don't know when he gets his first one. So 15 feels like a long, long, long way away. And and I wish him the best, but I I don't know. I don't it doesn't look good right now for Herb. At the very least, I hope he's okay physically, health wise. I hope everything's okay with him health wise. And let's see, any other scores? Yeah, one more. The Cowboys going to uh, the Chargers and beating the Chargers is impressive. No no question about it. And uh, they deserve props. All right, final segment will be quick. It'll be about the Indians, and, uh, and that'll be a wrap. All right, we'll be back in a couple of minutes. Hello, Brooks here with the Books with Brooks monthly book club podcast. We read one book a month and then we talk about it. Books like Stephen King's The Shining or Where the Crawdads Sing by Delia Owens. If you're on the hunt for book recommendations and enjoy sparkling conversation, come read along with us and then listen in. Hey, it's JD from the Hyman Podcast. I created this podcast to have hard conversations conversations that make us human but are also wildly uncomfortable conversations that help give voice to the voiceless and to the marginalized now you can listen to the entire first season on apple Podcasts, spotify or wherever you get your podcast from consider this your personal invitation to join the conversation hi my name is sam post owner of phenomwell cbd store and phenomwellcbd.com. That's like phenomenal, phenomwellcbd.com. Tune in where we talk with experts about how the amazing hemp plant can make a difference for people's health and well being from the Press Play Podcast Network. Hello, this is Don Mike Mendoza, the host of the Producing While Asian podcast. Join us to listen in on conversations with everyone who identify from producers to non-producers who all are part of the AAPI community. There's all that and more on the Producing While Asian podcast here on the Press Play Podcast Network. Want to hear more about your favorite TV shows and movies that are on countless streaming services? Then listen to Up Next with your new favorite hosts, me, Kristen Aviles. And me, Christina Walter. Every other week, we'll highlight one genre, but two movies or TV shows, one old and one new. We'll let you know what's hot and what's not from your favorite or least favorite streaming services. And be sure to stay tuned to the end of each episode where we shout out an artist whose name you should know for their talent in the industry. So follow us to stay up to date with your favorite hosts from Up Next, a part of the Press Play Podcast Network.
Welcome back to the Dennis Maniloff Show, part of the Press Play Podcast Network. Final segment, we'll use a couple of minutes on the Cleveland Indians. Why? Because they went into the boogie down. They went into Yankee Stadium and punked the Yankees on Saturday and Sunday, 11-3 to and 11-1, to respectively. That's news, not because the Indians are relevant. They're not. They're still sub-500 at 73-74. and 74. But it's news because... The Yankees are desperately seeking victories. They're scrounging for every victory they can to try to get into the playoffs wild card style. They're not going to win the division. Nobody is in the AL East other than Tampa Bay. But the Yankees are a wild card contender, and they hammered the Indians on Friday, eight to nothing, and probably thought they were going to cruise to a series sweep. The Indians had other plans, dropped 11 on them Saturday and 11 again today. Today, noteworthy for a number of reasons, on top of the fact that the Yankees got punked in their own building twice in a row, the fact that Gavin or Garrett Cole was starting for the Yanks. They're a $300 million man, and the Indians roughed them up. Gave up season-high 10 hits. I think it was seven runs. And so the Indians got the measure of Garrett Cole and embarrassed the Yankees for a second consecutive day. And if the Yankees... Uh, don't make the playoffs. They're going to look back at this series probably as crippling. They're also going to look back at the fact that they lost eight times to the Baltimore Orioles in the season series. Even though the Yankees won the season series over Cleveland four to three, it felt like a loss given what happened the last two days, two days within those last two games, Jose Ramirez was spectacular. Ramirez scored a total of seven runs uh, on, you know, in Saturday and Sunday combined. He had a homer off Cole today, he had a homer yesterday. And, you know, on the radio, I talked about Ramirez being the best bargain in baseball. I've said it here on the podcast. He's in the final year of his five-year $26 million deal, the final guaranteed portion of it. Then he's got two option years, club options, in 2022 and 2023. I've asked the Indians to tear up the club options and at least propose a new deal for him. I got some grief on the air today because I – keep talking about Ramirez and his contract situation, but I wouldn't keep talking about it if the Indians uh, did right by the player and offered him a new deal because they've gotten uh, an incredible bargain from him for five years from 17 through 2021. And we're not even done with 2021 to think that they would exercise the club option on him next year and maybe even 2023 and get bargain on him for seven years. That's almost unheard of in baseball to get this kind of a bargain from a star player for seven consecutive years. That's why I'm asking the Indians ownership to do the right thing. I'm not blaming the president, Chris Antonetti or the GM, Mike Chernoff or the players or the coaches or the managers. And, you know, in this case, Terry Francona an acting manager, then DeMarlo Hale, not blaming anybody except I'm saying to the ownership, you got to do right by the player and offer Hosey a new deal. But I guess I'm not allowed to say that too often because then people say that I'm being, uh, you know, melodramatic or I'm overdoing it. But I'm sticking up for a guy who's one of the best players in the game, who's vastly, vastly, vastly underpaid and deserves better from his team's ownership. All right. Thank you very much for the uh, taking the time to listen and I really appreciate it. And we'll talk to everybody soon.